Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone from all around the globe. My name is Eric Mail. I will help you moderate today's webinar on package compiler and static compilation in Julia. This webinar will provide a background on how to use packagecompiler.jl to cache the loading and compiled code of functions and packages, effectively removing the compilation overhead. You will learn how to create executable programs that can be run without requiring a Julia installation or providing any source code. We'd like to have this an interactive session today, so please write your questions in the chat. We'll either address them on the fly or address each question individually following the demonstration. With that said, I'd like to introduce you to today's presenter, Christopher Carlson. Christopher is a software engineer at Julia Computing, is a longtime contributor to the Julia language, specifically managing and debugging the 875 star package, packagecompiler.jl. He received his Master's of Science in Applied Mathematics from Chalmers University of Technology in Gothenburg, Sweden. Please welcome Christopher Carlson. Thank you for the introduction, Eric. So welcome to this webinar on package compiler and static compilation in Julia. Before we start, I'm gonna put in the chat the link to the slides here. So you can all have that. It's also on the top left here, but it's easier to just copy paste from the chat. So uh, just a very, very short uh, remind. Well, I work at Julia Computing, as Eric said, and most, mostly work on the open source projects and tools and I'm involved in developing and maintaining Julia itself, but also some of the packages around it. For example, the package manager and the debugger, and of course, package compiler, which is the focus of today's webinar. So a short outline then, this is sort of divided into three parts. The first part, I will talk about something that we call latency and sys images, which is a bit of sort of background information and. Um, so um, it's sort of useful to have this information to talk about package compiler later. And then in the second part, I'll talk about uh, using these system images with package compiler. And then the third part is creating these apps or standalone program with package compiler. And then in the end, we have some Q and A, but I will also try and look a little bit in the chat between these parts here to see if there are some specific questions on the part. So we can have questions um, as the, presentation goes on as well. So let's start with the first part then, which is about this latency. So the way we sort of define latency is the time we spend waiting for work to start happening from when Julia starts. So here we exclude um, one-time costs. So if we can cache some things, uh, so if we put in a one-time uh, one -time cost, then that is not part of latency. So uh, with some examples, I think it'll be pretty clear what I mean here. So the most common sources are package load time. We start Julia, we wanna load some packages and we have to wait for them to get loaded. So that is one part of latency. So here I load plots, it took three seconds and then we have to wait. So that's one part of the, the latency equation. The second part is when we compile functions and we also run something called type inference at that point, which is the first time we call a function we have to pay some cost. So here I'm timing uh, when I'm plotting something and I'm displaying the plot and it took seven seconds here. But when I run it again, it's very fast. So this is also one part of the latency equation where the first time we run something, it takes a bit extra time because we have to do the compilation. So the total latency here in the, it's commonly known as the time to the first plot and is the time of loading the plots package, which is three seconds and then time to compile the, the function in there, which is about seven seconds. So roughly around 10 seconds total latency here for showing a plot. So let's look first at uh, speeding up package loading. So one thing that's enabled by default in Julia is called package pre-compilation. And if you use Julia, um, I think you know pretty well what that is, but that is the, when you load a package for the first time, it runs, a uh, pre-compilation steps, which sort of caches things to make it faster to load the next time. Uh, and just to mention here in Julia 1.6, we have this thing called parallel pre-compilation. So if you start the package manager and you enter pre-compile there, it's gonna pre-compile things in parallel, which can be quite a lot faster than uh, what's shown here. 
Um, so here we're spending some time, 100 seconds here, uh, the first time we're loading plots. But if we go back, um, we saw that loading plots only take three seconds afterwards. So we spend some time and then we uh, get the benefit many times after that. Uh, we can turn off this package pre-compilation by giving a specific flag to you. Uh, this dash dash compile module is equal to no. And then uh, it takes around 30 seconds to load plots, which is faster than pre-compiling. But you can see if you load plots multiple time, you quite quickly uh, reach the point where um, doing the pre-compilation step is worth it. So pre-compilation is this one-time cost then for faster future package loads. So this is sort of what I mean with caching. If we spend some extra time at one point to make things uh, faster for future times. And this uh, pre-compilation cache that gets created is specific to the version of the package and all its dependencies. So if you update all your packages, then you have to do this again because the, the pre-compiled uh, modules or the pre-compiled files are no longer valid. But what's good about this is that this automatically happens. You, you don't have to think about, uh, oh, now I have to pre-compile my packages again. You just load them and the, and the uh, pre-compilation will happen automatically. So there's, that was uh, talking a little bit about uh, how to load packages and what takes time with loading packages. Let's look at some strategies for improving first call latency. So one thing we can do is we can reduce the optimization level. So if we start Julia with dash 01, which is to use the first optimization level, you can see it takes around four seconds to do this plot. But if you run with the default, which is 02, it takes almost six seconds here. So uh, that's, that's one way to do it, just to reduce the amount of optimizations done. Uh, you can also set the optimization level at sort of a module level granularity. So certain packages can say that, okay, I only need 01, for example, because my code uh, is not very performance critical and it's more important that it starts running fast quickly instead of, um, instead of running all these uh, optimization steps. So as an example of one of those packages is hard parse, which reads some command line input for, and, uh, and parses that. Um, and you can use that if you want to use, write command line tools. Uh, and in that case, it's very important that uh, it starts quickly because otherwise it's going to be slow to start Julia. But um, parsing some command line arguments is not, it doesn't require a lot of optimizations to be fast. So in our parse, they take down the optimization level of the package just to make it sort of uh, quicker, but uh, yeah, do less optimizations because they don't really do much for the package. So as I said, uh, not all con codes benefit from this O2. So sometimes you can use lower optimizations to give faster compile time. Uh, another way you can do is you can prevent something called specialization. So that means specialization means that we compile a function for a specific input argument. So if we have uh, some function here that takes an argument X, you, if you call this function with multiple types of X, you're going to compile a different version of this function for every type of X. You can also set an at no specialize around it, and then it's going to be just a generic function that gets compiled, compiled once. So it will be slower, but it will require less comp compilation. This is not very much used in user code. In Julia itself, it's used in some places, but um, in general, this is not really something that's heavily used, but it might be good to know about. So if you just sum, summarize a little bit of the latency reductions we have, then we can cache parts of the compilation. Uh, and this presentation and the future of it will basically be how we can cache more to, to reduce the latency. But we can also choose to compile less or we can optimize less. Sort of the three different things. So if we sort of look, evaluate these uh, different latency reduction strategies I present that we have the package pre-compilation and even with it, the uh, package loading time can still be quite significant. So that's sort of a drawback, but it's automatic and you don't have to think about it. Recompiles by itself and you don't need to sort of do anything manual. Um, you can look at uh, using a lower optimization level and no specialized, but these have the possibility of impact. So the runtime, which is you take down the optimization level and the code um, is, uh, needs that optimization level to be really fast and can be 
the drawback, and even with these tools, the latency can still be quite high. We saw plot still took, um, I think it was three, four seconds, even if we had a low optimization level. But a lot of functions and packages don't really benefit from these very high optimization levels. And in some cases, it's okay to, to pull this back. Uh, improving this latency is a high priority. So if I go to this link, it shows the Julia issue tracker where which uh, have all these latency label on them. And all of these are related to reducing latency. So you can see there's a lot open, but there's also many closed. So this is an uh, important, uh, important thing that's constantly being worked on. But even if a lot of work is spent on this latency fixing, it will likely never be really instantaneous to start Julia and make a plot with the strategies I've presented so far. Um, so you kind of require something else to be able to really get this sort of uh, low uh, latency. So if we look at something called the standard libraries, standard libraries, um, so Julia comes with a set of standard libraries and they are kind of structured like normal packages, but they load very fast. So here I sort of time of loading the package manager itself and it's very fast there compared to, for example, <coughs> plots like a hundred times faster. So how could that be? I mean, the package manager is kind of complicated package. So can't we just do sort of the same as what we do for the package manager for our own packages? So uh, that's what we're going to look at now, how Julia makes it so that loading these standard libraries is so fast. So one concept Julia have is that of a sys image. And you can sort of think uh, about a system, it's like it's a Julia session that have been taken and serialized down to, to a file. And if I look in my Julia install here and on my Mac, and it's in the Julia 1.6, and then I go into the lib folder and Julia, we have a system image in there. It's called sys.dlib and it's 151 megabytes. And what that includes is loaded packages, so all the standard libraries, and also compiled code. And these standard libraries are loaded into Julia when the system is created. So if I go to this link, um, can look at some of the Julia code here. And this is when Julia is created, this code runs. And here are all the standard libraries and they sort of get put into the system image when, when Julia is built. And if we just look how fast we can deserialize this serialized session, we just start Julia and do nothing, it takes about 0.2 seconds. So the format of this system image is, is quite good. It's quite fast to, to get it going after it's been uh, serialized. So uh, I made a system image, but I didn't put in any standard libraries in it. And I will show how that works. So we can give a dash dash system image a flag to you that use a custom system image. So I will start here with uh, a custom system image that I call no standard libraries. And then I start Julia with that one. And then for example, the REPL itself is a system image. So what it says now is that the REPL provider is not available. It's using basic fallback. So what we have here is not the real REPL. For example, if I try to press up or down um, here, see, I, I don't have my history and so on. So this is just a very, um, very, very basic REPL version. And if I try to load, uh, PKG in here, the package manager, you can see it takes much longer time than it did with my normal system image. So if I go back and I don't specify this and I load PKG, it's immediately. So here we didn't have the package manager in the system. Image. So it took a while to, to load it, but here we did. So then it was really fast. And <clears throat> If we look at the size of the system image when we don't have the standard libraries in it, we can see it's only 61 megabyte compared to the 150 megabytes. So it's just way less stuff in there. And, if we, and then if I load the package, then we have to sort of load it from an external thing, which takes longer time. So uh, I showed that standard libraries, they load fast, but how about uh, this first call latency? Are they also good at that? Well, if we use the default system image and we time, for example, the status output, goes pretty fast here, it's 0 0.04 seconds. But if I use the system image I showed just now without standard libraries baked into them, it takes significantly longer time. 
So Sys images also seem to help with this first call latency. So it's also loading package faster, but also have a lower latency when you do the first call. So the question is, how is that done? Well, to answer that, we have to think a little bit how Julia uh, compiles um, code. So if you have a generic method here, which is do something with an X, usually when you call this, an X is a float or X is an integer or something, uh, we usually specialize on the argument type. So we compile a version of this function for each different type that's put in. So we can sort of think that we want to compile things ahead of time. Like we want to sort of uh, compile things uh, before we even run them. So how can we know what types to compile methods for? And one idea is that we can sort of record what functions we compile for a representative workload. So this is a bit similar to profile guided optimization, if anyone has heard of that. So what we do is we define a representative workload and then we execute that once and record all the functions that gets compiled. And then we compile those. And then when someone else will uh, run that code, he will run something that's similar to the representative workload and it will be quick. So if I click here, there's an example of when, uh, when Julia is built, it actually runs a little representative workload in the repo. So it, for example, runs 2.2 in the repo, it does printing, it goes into shell mode and so on. So it does a little mini mini session and it records all the functions that gets compiled when it runs this so that it can cache that. And PKG also has uh, one of those little sample workloads. So the way we sort of trace or record what gets compiled is one way to do it is to send this dash dash trace compile equals standard error. Then it's gonna show all the functions that gets pre-compiled all the function that gets compiled uh, when we run code. So if I run, uh, I have some example compiled uh, file here, which is this um, one function. Then we call the function with an integer, with a float, and with a matrix. And then uh, Julia will spit out that, oh, I pre-compile this f function for an integer, float, and a matrix. And we can also redirect these uh, Compile outputs to a file. So this is one way to record all the all the um, compilation that Julia does, and that is what package compiler uses later. You, don't, you just to point out, you're not going to have to do this manually. This is just some background things, and package compiler can do this by itself. So, but this is just a little bit how how things work under the hood, so to say. So uh, we can try this trace compile when we use the default sys image. So if I go back here and I do trace compile, and maybe I just execute something, we can see it's there's only three uh, things that get compiled here because most of this is already compiled. Most of the repo is already compiled. It didn't, Julia didn't have to recompile this, which is why it's fast. But I also have a sys image where I didn't record any compile things in. So it's, um, and if I start using that one, you can see here it prints out way, way more. So this, all of this is stuff that it has to compile now when we didn't cache anything. Let's say I write one plus one. So Julia just does a lot of compilation in the background. So, so the difference of that and, and, um, the standard one is quite dramatic in how much needs to be compiled. So if we sort of do a bit of a conclusion here or idea for a tool to help with latency, we know that deserializing a system which is fast. So what if we could give a list of our own packages and put that into a custom system image? That will help with the load time. And then we also give a representative workload to figure out these types to compile specialization of generic methods as well. That will help with the first uh, latency of the first call. And then we start Julia with that custom system image instead that has our own stuff in it. And then we bundle this in a nice API to do this. And then we kind of profit and then we have a pretty good system. Uh, so if you think about it, this is kind of exactly what Julia itself does for its standard libraries and so on. It's just that we can also do that thing. 
And that is sort of what package compiler is. It's a way, one part of package compiler is a way to do this nicely. That brings me to part two, which is to create system images with package compiler. But before I go there, I'm just gonna check the chat to see if there are some questions. Don't think there's any question yet. Great, so I will just continue then and we can have more questions maybe by the end of the presentation. So that part one then was a little bit of background knowledge. Now we get into actually using package compiler. So um, it's quite simple to use, I would say, to use package compiler. It's a normal Julia package, so you just add it like anything else, and then you load it here. And then there's this uh, API to create a new system image. It's called create system image. And the first argument you give is what packages should go into the new system image. And then it's a keyword argument saying where should the custom system image be stored. So here I just called uh, create system image with plots, and I put it here called system image plots. And this took about 151 seconds. <clears throat> so it takes a while. But now if I load Julia using this custom system image, we can see that plots uh, goes very fast to load, right? Because if we think about it, plots now is kind of like a standard library. It's in the sys image. So it's already loaded when Julia starts. So we sort of raised plots from being a normal package to being treated equivalent to a standard library. So I can show that here. Let's see what was it called, this image underscore plots. Uh, that, uh, just get it up there. And now I load plots and see it, it's fast. But uh, if we look at the time to first plot, it takes five seconds here, which is a bit better than the seven seconds it used to be. But it's still not very fast, right? If we think about that, the only thing we did now was to put plots into the sys image, but we never gave it this representative workload that we talked about. So right now, Julia cannot know what uh, special function it should compile for plots. So that's the next step. So here I have a representative workload for plots, which is the, it's very simple. I just plot some random data and then I display it. Uh, now, maybe you say, oh, maybe I wanna plot something else and so on, but most of the code in plots uh, is, is the same, no matter what you plot there. There's a few differences, but most of the things are the same. So even if you have sort of a simple representative workload, it usually works quite well to reduce this latency. And the only thing we have to add from the previous slide is we add this precompile execution file argument. And then I add this precompile plot, this file here, and then it creates a new system image. So here it takes 184 seconds. It used to do 150 seconds. So this one is a bit slower because it needs to execute this precompile execution file. And Julia has to compile code for all these. But uh, the benefit then is if I load with this custom system image, system image plots precompile, then we can see that the time to first plot here is significantly smaller than it used to be. So I'll show that too. Um, it was this, and then it was like this. So we can see it was, it's uh, quite fast to load still. And then if we show plot, it's significantly faster than it was than before. So if I use, um, if I go back and I just use the standard sys image. This is sort of the default experience. Then it takes a while to load it. And it takes, um, I think it was around seven seconds for, for the first plot nine seconds now it's a bit slower because i am sharing my screen so that's sort of the difference now custom sys image see it, it feels faster and it is significantly faster so that is sort of uh, 
very shortly how great sysimage in package compiler works. You give it a set of packages, you say where do you want the custom sysimage to go, you give it some kind of a representative workflow, it creates a sysimage for you, and uh, that's usually quite significantly improves uh, latency. This is pretty useful if you want to run something, if you want to, if starting things up quite quickly is important to you, let's say you run something on the cloud and you want to start up things uh, quickly, then you can prepare one of these sysimages offline and use that one over and over when you start things up. So let's evaluate uh, a little bit about these custom sysimages. So it gives you a quite fast package load time. And it also gives you a low first call latency if you have one of these training scripts for representative workloads. Some drawbacks though is that it locks you to a set of version of the packages that you put into the sysimage. So when I created the plot sysimage, I put the version of plots there in there, right? And if I use the package manager to update plots, this the same version will be in the sysimage. And the same is true for the dependencies. So we don't have this automatic re-precompilation that we had with the standard package precompilation. So this is a bit manual. But if you have a, a set of dependencies that you're not changing very often, then that's usually quite okay. It's also a bit slower than the normal package precompilation. And it's, as I said, it's not automatic. So if you want to update your uh, dependencies, you have to create a new system image by yourself. And when is it good to use this then? Well, if the load time and first call latency is long enough to be annoying, <laughs> if everything is fine, then you don't have to use it. But for if you have a lot of dependencies and you just uh, want to start things quickly, it's, it's pretty good. And if you're not likely to frequently change the packages in the system, which if you're changing things every day, it can be quite annoying to have to redo the system, image. but if you have kind of a uh, a basic set of dependencies that don't change very often, then, then it works pretty well. Some packages that are quite good to use for the system, which is, um, I don't know if you know about Revise. Revise is a pre pretty nice package that sort of means you can change your package code interactively and Julia will automatically update um, the comp compiled code there. If you haven't checked out Revise, uh, I would do that. I use it all the time. Uh, or oh, my REPL is a tool that makes the, the REPL have syntax highlighting and so on. So that's something you kind of want to load every time you start the Julia REPL. And in that case, it's kind of important that you pre-compile it or you use a custom system image so the load time of the package doesn't annoy you. The debugger can be pretty nice to put in there. Plots, as I showed, and then if you have any other packages you use almost all the time, you can also put it in there. So that was part two uh, regarding sys images. Let's see if there's some question here. Oh, here's a question. How does the sys image port to other operating systems? Can I create one in Mac OS and use it in another OS? Thinking about cloud uses. Uh, right now you need to create it on the same OS that you're going to use it. That is true. So if you, let's say you want to use it in the cloud instance, I would start uh, Start a session there, create a system image on the cloud, and get that back somehow, and then use that one on the cloud. Um, so you need to use the same operating system as what you, uh, what you're going to run it. Mm. And then there's a question: Is there a way to create the system image by passing the pro project atomo file with all the packages in the project instead of specifying them directly as a list? Uh, right now. Unfortunately, you have to specify them, but in a couple of days, at least, I would change the default. So if you give, if we go back to here, if you give an empty list here, right now it puts, uh, if, if you don't give this first argument, right now it doesn't put any packages in it. But that's a really bad default because you usually you want to put default, you usually you want to put packages in the sys image. So I will change it so that if you don't have this argument, you will put all the packages in your project file instead. So the answer to your questions then would be to leave out this argument completely. That doesn't work right now, but I, I will fix it quite soon to make, make that happen. Can we use environments to use other package version when using a precompiled image? 
So no, if you're using a custom system image, the versions that are in the system image are sort of locked, no matter what other environments you're using. So that's one of these drawbacks that I that I showed here that it locks you to a set of versions. So it doesn't um, even if you run with a different environment um, with other package version, you would still use the one in your system image. I have some plans to fix uh, fix things in the package manager so you can detect when that happens and make the sort of warn you a little bit. But right now you have to just be aware of it. Okay, so let's move on to part three then, which is creating apps with package compilers. So the first one was sort of system images just to help with latency. And the third one is creating some sort of standalone applications. So if you think about it, if install and running on sort of an app as a Julia package is pre pretty easy with the normal way as well. You just install Julia, you use the Git or package manager to download the package. If there's a manifest in there, it records all the version of the dependencies so you can instantiate all the versions and so on. Then you can start Julia and use the package and start the app. So this is without using package compiler, just to show that it's possible. So as an example, I will use this redux.jl app that uh, this person has made. So if I go back here uh, and go to here. So here we have a, a package uh, that's an app sort of, so I can start Julia. I can load docs and then I can Um, we should, we should load this and then I can run and then I get this little toy uh, GUI here so this is a to-do application so the text is a bit small here. I don't think I can enlarge it, but it's asked me what needs to be done. And I can say, hold uh, the package compiler webinar, and it puts it in the list, and then maybe answer questions. And then when I'm done with this, I can mark them, and clear the completed, or just show the ones that are completed. So it's a little toy, toy application. And you can see here I could, um, run this using normal Julia with no, no tools. So that, that's one way to do it. But uh, it would be quite nice to just be able to ship and sort of an executable without requiring a uh, user to do all this. It requires to install Julia, it requires to start Julia and load a package and so on. And so uh, to do that, we can think a little bit how Julia itself is, is shipped and what does Julia itself include. Uh, so Julia includes the Julia runtime itself. It includes various other libraries that it needs, for example, LVM for compilation. It uses open blobs for uh, different uh, linear algebra operations. It has a, a Git library in there that the package manager uses. So in all, Julia itself is a system image that has these pre-baked packages and it has compiled code and it has some other libraries and it has the Julia runtime libraries. And it also has an executable that initializes Julia and start off the REPL. And that is sort of all that Julia is these different parts. It has the executable that starts the REPL. It has the sys images. It has some other libraries you need and it has the Julia runtime library. And that is sort of the whole of Julia you get when you download it. And what's a bit interesting here is we can think about this executable here that initializes Julia and kicks off a, a REPL. Now we could sort of put in our own executable here that instead of starting a REPL starts uh, our own Julia code. So that is sort of a little <laughs> hint of how, how this will work. So the idea then for creating an app is that we use a custom sys image with our own packages and that we compile like before for good latency. So this is basically the whole of uh, part two about using system images. So we use one of those. And then we bundle the Julia runtime libraries as well. So we have those available because Julia needs them. And then we create an executable with a custom entry point here that starts up our app. 
instead of the REPL, it starts up our own code. So if you think about the little toy, toy app I just showed, instead of starting the REPL, we start up that toy app instead. And then we don't need to bundle any source code or anything because everything is stored inside the sys image. So that is sort of the, the plan then for, for creating an app. So the way this works with package compiler is that you give it a, an input as to where it should be, where your app is, and then where it should the compiled app go. And you can also give it an execution file, like uh, just like with the sys image. And so if I do this, uh, if I create an app with this Redux app that I just uh, used here, so I can, you see I could just use it in Julia, but I can also tell package compiler to create a standalone app from this. And this takes quite a long while, but in the end it has created this sys image with, uh, with this app in it and the dependencies. It has bundled all the Julia libraries. It has bundled all the artifacts, which is libraries packages use. For example, this Redux app, uh, application uses the C in GUI library. And it has created an executable that runs a function called Julia main in the package, which is sort of the thing that uh, starts everything. So yeah, if I go to these Redux uh, compile, this is what was created when I ran this create app function. And we look in here, you see we have the different artifacts here, which are the libraries used by the app. We have a lib folder, which contains all the Julia libraries and so on. And then we have a bin folder. If I go in here, I have, uh, this is an executable and this is a custom sys image. So now if I just run this Redux app here, um, like a normal any normal executable, you see we start the, the same app here. Uh, and I can put in um, things in here, just like before, click and so on. And what's uh, important about this is that this whole uh, folder, everything that is needed for this binary to run is in here. So in theory, you could, uh, you could uh, put this in a, in a compressed um, in a tarball or something and send it to some other place and they could also run it straight away. Assuming that it's uh, also on the same operating system. So this, I created this in a Mac, so it also needs to run on a Mac. So one thing that might be a bit interesting to look at is how, how big is this whole thing? Well, it's unfortunately it's quite big. So the total size is around 290 megabytes. Compressed, it's about 80 megabytes. Uh, from this 290 megabytes, around 95 megabytes is the custom sys image. Now this is actually smaller than the default sys image. 65 megabytes is this open glass library. And it's a little bit unfortunate because in this particular instance, we don't need it. So there's a to do here to make it a bit more automatic in which of these libraries we don't really need to ship. Uh, right now, things are not really set up in a way that that's easy to figure out, but there is work in progress to make that happen. There's a uh, LLVM is around 44 megabyte uh, because even though we do um, pre-compile things, it's still the chance that you might want to do more compilation during the runtime. So it needs to be there, but there's also work in progress to sort of separate the <clears throat> compilation part of Julia with the runtime. So there's also different compile flags that might be able to be used to make this less, less required. And then the artifacts, they are pretty much needed. It's just the libraries that the app needs to use. So that in total, if you, these are sort of the big things in there, but what we can reduce uh, in the future is this these big libraries that are not needed and maybe this also LLVM. Uh, so the question then is can I use any package and make an app from it? Uh, well uh, the answer is that uh, almost but the, the packages need to be a little bit careful what they do because um, they need to be the, what I call relocatable and that is that they don't embed too many assumptions about the machine the app will run on when they get pre-compiled. So what I mean with that is that sometimes, uh, I think I have, an, I have an example here. So one example that would not be 
uh, relocatable than is if you use absolute paths. So sometimes uh, packages, they have a build file. In the build file, they try to find some library on the machine. And then they create a file which, uh, with a variable that points to the, to the path of this library. And then in their file, they include this, this file and they sort of open that library when the module is, when the package is loaded. Now, the problem here is that this file library uh, found an absolute path to, to the library. And if we would send this to another machine, this path would be wrong, right? Because it wouldn't be the same absolute path as somewhere else. So this would be one instance where you would have code that it's not relocatable. Now, uh, what you can do instead is use the artifact system, which is what uh, the app I used, I showed right here used. So if you go into the artifacts directory, there, there are a bunch of uh, big folders in there, but all of them are created using the artifact system, which is a way to not have to do this stuff here. So if you use that, you, you're going to be fine. Uh, and uh, there's, there's a link here in the slides um, to the artifact um, documentation in, in PKG about it. So in general, use the artifact system instead of using this custom stuff. And it's going to be work well. Another problem with uh, relocatability is if you try to include source files at runtime, because remember there are no, when we created this sys image, there's no source files that exist. If I go back to the terminal here and I look, um, there, there are no, there's no source, Julia source files anywhere here. All of the code is in the sys image here. So if the code would try to load some Julia file, it couldn't find that, right? And that would mean that it would error when it ran on another machine. But uh, more and more packages are moving over to the artifact system and are getting aware of this relocatability. So more and more of the ecosystem is available to use as an app. So that's a good progress there. So again, let's do a short evaluation of Julia applications. So it is possible to distribute application made from Julia packages that kind of just runs. You don't have to install anything special. You just double click the executable, it runs. And thanks to the sysimage and this pre-compiled script or the, the representative workload script, this application has quite low latency. Uh, as I said before, you, doesn't support cross compilation because UD itself doesn't cross compile. So you need to compile it in a machine that uh, has the same uh, operating system that you're going to run it on. And it's also a bit big for, uh, as I said, it was like 200 megabytes something. It's a little bit big if you want to create really small uh, command line utilities. So there, uh, there's uh, work to be done. And this pre-compiled script can be a little bit difficult to automate if you have interactive packages. So that's a bit of a drawback as well. The final thing I, I want to mention as a little bonus is uh, uh, Julia libraries. So uh, uh, Julia library is when you can call Julia function from, for example, C. And uh, see how I'm doing in time. I think, okay. So I can show first show uh, just an example of that. So there's this uh, good example in, called libcg. So what we have there is that we have a, a, a normal Julia package it's called cg. If we look here, it, um, it loads some iterative solvers and then it can, uh, it can do this conjugate gradient method. It's a way of solving a linear system, basically. So let's just say this is some Julia code, some workload that you want to call from C. And then we have some C code in this example, and here in this main.c. And what this does is it sets up uh, a matrix and it just does some setup over the part, important part here that it calls this Julia CG. It calls a Julia function here. And this Julia function is the same if we go back to the package, it's exactly this function that it calls. So this is sort of the, the bridge between C and uh, and Julia. Um, and then it calls, uh, 
it calls it here. And then it checks that the answer is uh, what, it, what it should be. So this is just a toy example of what you might want to call into Julia to do. And quite recently, a functionality was added to package compiler that makes this uh, a lot simpler. So I don't have very detailed um, slides on it, but there's an entry in the package compiler documentation here. It's not lines or something. Um, and it shows how you do it and so on. And this libcg um, example is really good to have as a sort of starting point. And it has to make files and so on. So if you have a situation where you wanna, where you have some Julia code that you wanna call from, let's say a, a C, C code, then starting with this example is, is a good idea. And if you think about the difference to an app is that instead of getting an executable, you get a library instead. But with the functionality in here, you still bundle all the artifacts and so on. So you can still ship this over to some other machine. Um, so the big difference is that you don't have a Julia app you want to use to have Julia functionality that you want to call from somewhere else. And of course, it doesn't have to be from C. And the, they also have an example in this one here where they call it from, from Rust. And basically anything that can call into calling using the C calling convention, which is almost any any programming language can can use this. So finally, I put some useful links here. Uh, if you're interested in these things, it's the package compiler docs, but also various blog posts. And there's also a good, uh, if you're interested in this last thing about these Julia libraries, there was a nice JuliaCon talk about it. Um, this latest JuliaCon and this new functionality. So I would recommend looking at that, goes in a bit more detail there. Um, yeah, so I think that's it for the slides. Um, the slide URL is here. I, I put it in the chat in the beginning, but if you didn't see that, you can copy, look at it here. And then I'll go to the um, Zoom chat again, if I can find it here. So the question here is, is it possible to create apps with dynamic link libraries in order to decrease the size? Uh, so what you mean there maybe is that uh, instead of bundling all the, the Julia libraries, you can sort of have them on the, on the target machine instead. And, and that is possible. Uh, it's just that package compiler doesn't really support that out of the box right now because it tries to sort of do the, the simple thing where it doesn't assume any, almost anything about the target machine. But uh, there could be a way where you could have some flag to the create app function to sort of use the same shared libraries from multiple apps to reduce the size. That is true. I think that's all for questions. Are there any other questions? Maybe you want to just uh, unmute and possibly ask Christopher a question. We'll leave a couple seconds for that to happen. Otherwise, we can wrap it up. Well, thanks everyone for your participation and thank you, Christopher, for your time and excellent presentation. For the recorded versions of this presentation and our past webinars, you can visit the resources tab at juliacomputing.com. For any help with your existing Julia use case or upcoming Julia project, please reach, in, please reach out to us at sales at juliacomputing.com. We're more than happy to help. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great remainder of your week.